Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Yola National at Home. Uh, my name is Angelica Cortez. I work for the LA Phil, and I have the great joy and honor of introducing you all to the fabulous Joseph Conyers, who is the uh, founder and executive director of Project 440. So I'm just here to say hello to you and to uh, let you know that you can feel free to use the chat feature or the Q&A function in Zoom if you have any questions for our speakers today. Um, and beyond that, I'm gonna pass it over to Joe so that he can introduce you to the rest of our fantastic panel today. Thanks, awesome. Joe. Awesome, thank you, Angelica. Of well, hello everyone. Um, as Angelica said, my name is Joseph Conyers. I wear a lot of different hats. It can be a little confusing. It's a little crazy, but uh, um, I will, I'm here speaking with wearing my executive director of Project 40 hat, which I'm very proud of, um, of being part of for many, many years now, over a decade, which is really, really exciting. I also am the assistant principal double bass of the Philadelphia Orchestra. Um, I conduct the All City Orchestra here in, in Philadelphia, which are the top performing students of the School District of Philadelphia. And uh, I'm on faculty at the Juilliard School and Temple University. So those are all the hats that I wear. And I, the reason I mention all that, because it ties very much in to why Project 40 got started and why we do the work that we do. And before we all dive in, we have a huge team here. So I would like to ask them all to un, um, uh, make it so that we can see everyone. And I will pass it off to our managing director, Hillary Dow Ward, who can introduce herself. Hillary. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Joseph, for setting us up so nicely today to start this panel discussion. I'm really excited to be here with the, uh, some more of our Project 440 team and alumni to talk to you a little bit about what it is that we do and why it is we love the work that we do and share with the world. So I come from K-12 background and higher education, and I joined the Project 440 team just in January. I absolutely love the work of this organization and I'm excited for you to learn more about us today. And I'm going to pass it off to our program director, my fabulous colleague, Dr. Susanna Lowy. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Susanna Lowy, and I'm the program director for Project 440, which means that I develop and implement, help to implement, because we all work together, uh, much of the programming um, that we are going to be talking about today. Um, in the rest of my life, I am a flutist, and uh, to that end, I play with uh, some groups in the DC area called the Inscape Chamber Orchestra and a group in the Lancaster area called the Naked Eye Ensemble. Um, those are both modern uh, leaning groups. And then I also sub around uh, Philadelphia. And then I'm on the faculty at Kutztown University and Rowan University. I will hand it off to Michael O'Brien. Good afternoon, everyone. I am a proud board member for Project 440. Um, I'm located in Philadelphia and here in the city, I'm a fellow at a think tank here called the Lindy Institute for Urban Innovation at Drexel University, where my work focuses on the future of work and the humanity around that issue and cause. Um, I'm also at a space called the Village of Arts and Humanities, where I'm their director of learning, working on workforce opportunities for young folks ages 14 to 26, focused in the tech and media industries. And last but not least, I have my own consulting practice, which takes my research and helps organizations like the Federal Reserve Bank and organizations like Project 440 figure out what does the future of work look like from a very human-centered perspective and a human-centered lens. Thank you. I'll pass it off to Chloe. Hi, everyone. My name is Chloe Cooper, and I am a sophomore at the University of Tampa. I play the flute, and I am currently majoring in entrepreneurship with a minor in music. Um, I've been a part of Project 440 since 2018, um, and I was actually introduced to Project 440 uh, through uh, Marquise from the Doing Good program. Um, and from there, my friend Claire and I were able to start our, our own nonprofit called Generation Music, um, where we go to schools in the city of Philadelphia and we teach music through a variety of um, in person, well, what used to be in person lessons and workshops um, with after school programs as well. well I'll go next. Yes. Claire, perfect. <laughs> I'm Claire Casanova. I am a sophomore at Temple University. I play clarinet and I'm there for music education. Uh, much like Chloe, I or just like Chloe, I joined 2018 um, after Marquise introduced me to the Doing Good Project, where we were able to create Generation Music as um, just a, a link to classical music to younger students. 
Professor Bradley. Hello, everyone. My name is Marquise Bradley, and I play the clarinet, and obviously I'm from Philadelphia. I'm This fall, I'm going to be a sophomore at the Cleveland Institute of Music, and I will also be a minor in uh, organizational leadership at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, when I was in Project 40, I started as a freshman in high school when Mr. Conyers became the conductor of the All City Orchestra and started kind of implementing the Project 440 programming into the All City curriculum. And since then, Project 440 has blossomed to the West Coast. <laughs> and I'm still involved as an alumni doing some peer mentoring for this uh, summer's virtual camp. And it's always a pleasure working with and learning from everyone in Project 440. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Marquise. So I thought I'd dive in next to, to, so we can learn about what Project 440 is and what we do and who we are. And what is this Project 440? So um, Project 440, and this is how I like to start the conversation about Project 440. Project 440 is a music organization that does not teach music. I will repeat that. We are a music organization that does not teach music. Project 440 uses music as a tool to teach entrepreneurship, leadership, and service and high school musicians via an after-school program. Uh, we also teach college and career skills. So for Project 440, music is the lens. Music is the jumping off point to which young people can discover and know the world. So we've all been struggling through this pandemic and the pandemic has been um, uh, uh, disrupting <laughs> and on every single level. And the, the thing about Project for 40 and its relationship to the pandemic is what are many of the things that we teach our young people about, and that is being entrepreneurial and having this entrepreneurial spirit. Also having the agency to go out and make change and do something. Um, we hope that our students, when life happens, because this pandemic, while crazy, is a part of life, can still thrive in, in, in an environment and be successful. If there is no pandemic, what does that look like? in the regular world, and we were going to learn more about that as we hear about our programs from Dr. Lowy. So this kind of portfolio career uh, approach is something that we, we embrace. Classical music, particularly, that is my world, I is uh, playing in an orchestra. Uh, it can be very limiting on what musicians can do and our role in the world. Is my role just to play the bass? And there are some people who, who where that is exactly what they do, and that, that is it. But I would contend, are we only using one small percentage of the possibilities of what we can do as musicians? And so for me, it really is having this portfolio career of being a music musician in the Philadelphia Orchestra, but it also being a mentor for students through the All City Orchestra and conducting in that program. It's with Project 440 and teaching young people, giving them the life skills to be able to thrive and to be successful. At least uh, having an entrepreneurial mindset, having a growth mindset, and really being able to like take situation and figure out a way to, to have that control. And that is what we do with Project 440. So we're a different approach to music education. There are many programs in Philadelphia that teach kids how to play. And we think that is important. As a musician, I think it is important students know how to play. But fewer organizations d dive in, I feel like, in the way that Project 440 does. And I would say it's almost like we don't, we, 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 this is gonna sound strange, particularly come from a musician, but work with me. It's almost like we aren't distracted by the music creating part, like, like, cause that of course is important, but few people spend that time about like, what are the, the tangible ways that music can be used to connect kids or connect young people? The tangible ways we can use music to teach about college and to teach about careers. Cause there are many, many, successful people who go on off to careers who don't become musicians, but still love music. And that's the thing. I feel like in many ways in classical music, we kind of put ourselves in this, into this, uh, um, this box that if you teach a kid how to play a violin, then they must end up on the stage of an orchestra. No, they might want to just play the violin for fun. And it's okay, because they're kids. And that's what young people can do. If, however, they do want to make that next step and become a professional musician, they will then have the tools and the skills to be successful in that space, to know that as a musician, they can do other things besides play the notes on the page, which are very important because there are many of them. But they'll be, they'll be able to 
figure out ways to engage with their community and engage with young people and make connections with, um, uh, with institutions that the orchestra may not have those connections to. So um, I don't know if we're, are we on the second, oh, I, we just lost my camera and I'm gonna bring it back. I'm back, no worries, I'm all, everything's fine. Uh, <laughs> so um, our philosophy is equity, inclusion, collaboration, um, and uplifting youth voices. We, uh, you'll learn in one of our programs that um, uh, the Youth Advocacy Council that you'll learn about shortly, uh, but we do have opportunities for the youth to serve on the board. There's a board position in our organization that is uh, held by a member of the Youth Advocacy Council. It's also not just classical music, y'all. We use music as a tool. So yes, even as someone who plays in the orchestra, the, 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 particularly the classical music route, I grew up in Savannah, Georgia, and my upbringing was in gospel music. And I bring that same enthusiasm of gospel music that I still love to this day to the stage of the Philadelphia Orchestra. So instead of it being limiting, it's about how can we have these kind of cross-genre connections, connectivity to uplift each other and ultimately make the art form, all of our art form and music better. And that is our goal. So you see our mission statement there before you, Project 40 helps young people use their interest in music to forge new pathways for themselves and ignite change in their communities. And that's what we want them to do. Um, music is a tool. Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms are fantastic, but they can be used as tools to help young people find success. Music as an entry point to life. So it's not a music, music is not just an entry point to learning about Bach, they, Beethoven and Brahms and learning about um, uh, uh, the, the particularly like European culture is not is not about that. It's actually a, a jumping off point to learn about life and how to be a successful citizen, but also a caring and giving citizen. Um, and is artis artistic excellence enough? Is that where are we headed? I mean, this is a larger overarching conversation that our industry can be having. We aren't saying it's one way or the other, but what we are saying is might we be limiting ourselves in the field of classical music if we are just doing this one thing? How can we be of help to the world? So I, you have heard enough from me, <laughs> and I would love to pass it off to our director of programs, uh, Dr. Susanna Lowy, who can tell you more about our work. Dr. Lowy. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much. Um, so I uh, am here to tell you about our four main programs. We call it our four pillars. Um, and so I'm going to actually talk to you first about the last two that you see there on that screen, the College for, Mu for Musicians and the Youth Advocacy Council, because then I'm going to really delve in in depth about the first two programs. Our College Fair for Musicians is a college fair that's held at the Kimmel Center every year. We have um, more than 50 colleges uh, come, um, everything ranging from Juilliard to Temple to the New England Conservatory to the Westminster Choir College, and uh, more than 300 attendees last year came. Uh, and it's a whole day of students being able to uh, get to know the college music departments. Uh, so that's what sets this college uh, fair apart from all other college fairs, is that it is the specific music departments of each school that are coming to get to know musicians. Um, students don't have to want to major in music to get information about the music departments. As um, many of you probably know, a lot of these schools will offer scholarships to students that just want to continue playing in college, whether or not they want to major in music. And the other thing that sets our college fair apart is that um, we have workshops throughout the day. We, last year we had a, a career speed dating session where uh, we had 10 different music types, uh, music careers, all um, sitting around different tables in a room and the students rotated and found out about all the different things they can do uh, as a musician beyond um, playing and teaching. Um, and then we have all sorts of other different workshops throughout the whole day. And to, high, uh, to top it all off, we have our raffle, uh, which actually becomes um, a, an initiative for them. It works. Students really end up staying through the whole day to be there for the raffle at the end of the day. Now this year, our fair will be virtual. Um, so this is uh, going to be a new venture. But we're hoping that um, with this virtual fair, we'll be able to appeal and offer um, the uh, the college information um, and the workshops to students uh, across the country. So in a way, it's um, exciting. And then our youth advocacy, oh, and by the way, that's in uh, the beginning of November. Is it November 9th this year? 
believe. November 11th traditionally. November then, 11th. Yeah, but we might, we might, yeah, it could get creative this year. Stay tuned. It's very exciting. You'll want to learn more. <laughs> Got it. Um, then our Youth Advocacy Council is actually for alums of our programming. So this is for um, high school students and college students that have stayed around the Philly area to continue to be part of the Project 440 family and to influence our programming, tell us what's working, what's not, and then also to create their own programming in Philadelphia to continue to make a difference in their community. Um, and as Joe mentioned, um, a member of the Youth Advocacy Council is also a part of our own board. Uh, so it's kind of a mini board that is also functioning as a um, community service um, uh, committee. So um, now to talk about our two main programs. The first one is Instruments for Success, and this is a 10 session college and career preparation program. And I say session because while usually it's once a week, it doesn't have to be once a week. It's just that we have 10 sessions of two hours. Um, and this is all about information on applying to college, auditioning and interviewing, finding financial aid um, for musicians, and even some about college board testing, where it's necessary, where it's not. We have an amazing, amazing college counselor that uh, leads the whole uh, program. Um, and he's really figured out how to make um, the college application process for students that are interested in music accessible. We also have um, within that program three speakers that come and work with the students. And these speakers, we always have a range of people that come. So we'll have somebody perhaps that's making music their career, but not in a traditional way. Um, or we'll have somebody that uh, um, went through musical training, but then is doing something else and talks about how their musical training still influences their daily life. And my favorite example of that is a, um, a classmate of Joe's from Curtis uh, who um, had a career in the army band um, and then got drafted by the FBI and became an F is Joe telling me it's CIA or is it FBI I always mix it he's up. FBI agent in New York thank you FBI agent in New York so he's <laughs> now an FBI agent in New York and he came and talked to the students about how not only his musical training um, in terms of um, all of the strengths that he developed as a musician, how that's important in his daily life as an FBI agent, but also the connections that he still has through being a musician, how all of that just has really um, been formative to his career. So that's an example of one of the speakers. Uh, but every time that we hold an Instruments for Success class, we have three different speakers. Um, and then again, the other seven sessions are with our college counselor. Now, one of the problems that we had seen with speaker series and with classes in general is that it can start to come turn into like one-off sessions. Uh, and they're, um, it's hard to create a real arc of a curriculum. So what we did to combat that is to have a teaching artist who's there through all of the sessions, all 10 sessions. And so the speakers and the college counselor take the first portion of the class, the first hour, hour and 15 minutes. We give the students a little break where we offer them pizza back in in-person world. And then for the last 40 minutes or so, the teaching artist both reflects on what um, the, the students learned that day, but also ties everything together with everything that's already happened in the class. Um, so that the, the class really uh, um, takes on a scope, uh, even within just the 10 sessions. Um, now, you see I skipped over that first bullet point that says stipend based. Now, we firmly believe that students' time is worthwhile. And it's um, the, the, a lot of students have a very real choice that they um, have to make between having an after school job and being part of a program with necessary information for um, the rest of their life. And we didn't want, um, at Project 440, we wanted students to be able to merge those two things. So we pay the students for Instruments for su Success, we pay them $10 an hour for coming to class. So each class, they have the, uh, possible, uh, the capability of earning $20 for a total of $200 if they come to all 10 classes. Um, so, and we, uh, base their, uh, their stipend off of uh, the Philadelphia um, school district's 
uh, attendance policy, which is 70%. If you attend 70% of your classes, you pass. So if they come to at least seven classes, they earn $140. However, if they only come to six classes, they don't get the stipend. And this isn't because we're mean and have arbitrary cutoffs, but because we want a real cohort of students. We didn't want students just dropping in on one particular session, but we want them to feel a real dedication to uh, the course and to their peers. Uh, so um, that's the Instruments for Success uh, course and moving on to doing good, uh, which you know, you've heard uh, several times people mention. So this is a class about leadership and entrepreneurship through music. This is a more intensive course. It is between 25 and 30 sessions, depending on how the timing and uh, the cohorts line up. Um, the first uh, half of the, the sessions are workshop based. So the students are doing a lot of work on leadership uh, evaluation and um, they're developing their entrepreneurial skill set. And um, they're also looking at their communities, figuring out what their communities need, and then determining how they can best con fix that need in their communities through music. Um, so one of the things that we really stress through uh, those first 10 to 15 sessions is that the students not only look inside themselves at what their strengths are and what they need to develop, but they're also really recognizing um, the same things in their peers because what they're going to do is they're going to take their ideas of what how they want to um, change their communities through music and they're going to form teams and create project pitches um, and so what they figure out that they need to do is they need to find people for their teams that uh, complement their skill sets so that you're not going to they are not going to just form uh, teams with their best friend or their boyfriend, um, but instead they're going to find people that have skill sets that work together well with theirs. So um, they're identifying what it takes to be a good leader and how to improve upon their own leadership skills. They uh, learn um, about diversity and inclusion. And then we do uh, quite a bit of work on community engagement and interactive performance. So how to relate to people in a performance within many different learning modalities. And um, uh, they create interactive activities that relate to specific audiences. And then they start to move their ideas into action. They uh, have, um, they create budgets for their programs and they um, uh, experiment and um, dive into the world of advertising for their programs and they pitch their projects to a panel of industry professionals uh, and they get feedback now this is not meant to be a mean session where they're getting beaten down about their ideas but instead they're just getting advice about how to actualize their programs after they've been given the okay each project is given $500 seed money and they create their programs. So each student in the uh, takes the doing good class creates uh, change in their communities through music. This course is also stipend based. They have um, eleven dollars an hour plus an hour of homework after each session. I know you're thinking, why 11 instead of 10? Well, it's because uh, we had 30 uh, sessions and um, we wanted to be offer $1,000 for completing the course. So um, 30 sessions with three hours uh, for each session, two hours for the class and one hour for their homework, they can earn, it's technically $999. But if, if any student um, came to every single class and did every single assignment, we would give them the extra dollar and give them $1,000 <laughs> instead of $999. Um, so each student has uh, is earning money through the program and is examining um, the leadership and entrepreneurial skills and creating the change. Um, we can move on to the next slide. Thanks. So then at the end of the course, the students have a, a graduation and um, project showcase um, that they it's open to all their parents and friends. And we make it a, a nice uh, celebratory um, event with um, you know a real graduation with pomp and circumstance playing and the students each each group gives about a five to ten minute presentation of how their program went 
Um, so I just see a question, uh, sorry, a question that popped up about class size for the Doing Good workshops. Um, there is, so we, we're having 25 students per cohort, uh, and, and the cohorts are offered one to two times each year. And in Instruments for Success, the class size was limited to 35 uh, students, and it was offered twice a year. Uh, and so somebody wanted to know the examples of the projects. Thank you. That is one of the next things I wanted to talk about. So you're going to hear from um, three of the students later on that can tell you about their projects. So I will not um, go into theirs. Um, one of the groups from a couple years ago wanted to promote uh, literacy uh, through music. So they created a concert at a library and the idea was to have the cost of admission to the concert be a book that would be donated to um, schools in need of expanding their libraries. Um, another project from last year was uh, combining mental health awareness with music and so the students created lesson plans um, that were meant to help people who were struggling, um, help high school students that were struggling with their mental health um, through music. So they created a series of lesson plans that they submitted to um, different uh, schools that they knew had um, programs for students uh, with mental health uh, difficulties. Um, another program last year uh, aimed at promoting an environmental message and so and they actually expanded from not just music but they created a photography um, and fashion design and musical uh, uh, presentation that had an environmental message. Uh, so those are just a few examples. Um, each cohort we have maybe three to five different programs. Um, and uh, so we, did I answer all the questions? We can um, move on to the next slide because I'm sure you're all wondering how are we going to do this in the midst of a pandemic? Well, this summer we've started something that we're calling Project 440 Online. I know that's a very uh, original titling, but no, it's memorable. You will, you will remember exactly what it is. And um, through Zoom um, and Yola, thank you so much, Yola, we have launched a virtual camp that is um, kind of doing good in Instruments for Success light. So we have um, six classes of each of the different programs and then a third session each week that ties everything together with teaching artists. Um, and so what we'll be doing in the fall is launching our programs online, uh, not only uh, for students in Philadelphia, but also nationally. So um, exactly how that's going to work is that in terms of dates and times and um, funding um, is still being developed, um, but we really feel that being able to do uh, Project 440 online this summer has been an amazing opportunity in terms of being able to offer our programming to students throughout the country and perhaps even internationally um, beyond the uh, students that we have been so dedicated to in uh, the city of Philadelphia. So we're excited. Um, the summer program is all over, I just saw another question come up, come up, which is what is the size of the summer program and the location of the students? The location of the students is all throughout the country and it, it, we've had about 100 students um, that registered for it. So it's, uh, it's been a really great experience. Um, and Rod, you'd be welcome to join in during our last week just to observe if you wish. Uh, so without further ado, because I know everything always takes longer than we think, I'm going to pass off um, to Michael O'Brien to talk a little bit more about why we're doing what we're doing. Hey everyone, so I'll be brief. This is actually an area I get really excited about because it uh, wholly connects to all my research and the things that I'm interested in around like, what is the future of work? We're in this really interesting time in the world where the economy is transitioning and we were already transitioning and now it's sped up a lot more. So, you know, one of the reasons why we built our programs to be the way that they are is because if you think about the way that humans develop, people develop in systems that are embedded in other systems that are embedded in other systems. It's a complex web of relationships and systems that are both interpersonal, person to person, and then these huge relationships from person to neighborhood, person to school system, person to state, to country, to wider culture. And so this uh, 
photo here is just an example of something technically called social ecological theory or systems theory. They also might even call it like nested systems theory. But it's the fact that a person is embedded in a family that's also in a home that is in a neighborhood or community. And community can be really complex, right? There are artistic communities that we're all a part of. I'm also a part of like an academic community. You've got, I'm black, I'm part of the black community, right? There's so many ways that people can be a part of community. And even now in a hyper digital age, we have digital communities, right? And so Project 440 has built a digital community with Project 440 online. But it's important to remember that all of these relationships are impacting the individual and the individual even though it doesn't always seem like it, is having a form or some form of impact on these other systems. The further out you go, you need more individuals to be connect, excuse me, to be uh, impacting these larger systems. So it's hard for one person to maybe impact the entire state, but groups of people coming together can definitely impact the entire state, right? And so one of the things that we're trying to get young people to understand is that they, even at their age, are embedded in a world of systems and how can they best serve themselves, these systems, and then also as an organization, how are we paying attention to the way that these systems are impacting young people and how can we best show up in collaboration and in service to young people? Can you hit the next slide for me, please? And so it's important to remember that identity does matter and that identity doesn't just stop with our cultural or ethnic identities, our racial identities, our gender or non-gender conforming based uh, identities, that identities are about traits and characteristics. They're about social relationships, roles, memberships in groups that define who you are. And it's also important to remember that identities can be focused across the time spectrum. So they can be focused on the past, the present, or they can be focused on the future. And it's important that when we're supporting young people or thinking about young people that we understand the nuances around their identities can shift in any given moment and from day to day or week to week because adolescence or being a teenager is about kind of bumbling through your identity, figuring out who you are, figuring out what might be stable, figuring out what you wanna change, figuring out what you don't like and being able to experiment or try new things. You also gotta remember that teenagers come with the pressures of the world on their back and how might those things, particularly in COVID-19, how might things like trying to go to school every day online, trying to figure out what college you're going to in a world that's really uncertain. How might those things be pressuring young people to have to think about the way that they're going through the world? And again, this is important to us because again, our job as an institution is to be showing up in collaboration and on behalf of and in service of these young folks that we love. Can you hit the next slide, please? And so when it came down to both the college programming and doing good or instruments for success and doing good, it was important for us to ground both the identity, the identity exploration factor of youth and adolescence and this idea that young people are having to deal with systems on top of systems on top of systems in a theory around what moves them towards their well-being uh, in connection to economics and money. Because at the end of the day, people need money to survive. So one of the things that we've definitely looked at is this uh, research around the future of work, right? And what's fascinating about the future of work and the future of jobs and job training is that as automation, as technology is taking over jobs that were easily accessible to most folks, you have this new emerging problem of, well, we've got to figure out what jobs are going to be what we would call resilient in the face of technology. What jobs are going to be stable in the face of technology? And then you have to ask, well, then what skill sets are going to be you know, useful in these jobs that technology is either partnering with, replacing, like where does the human fit into the matter? And what's fascinating is that what, they found, what we found in the research is that creativity, uh, communication, complex communication skills, abstract thinking, systems thinking, um, conflict management, very human-centered skills, very human-centered um, processes are the ones that technology is not good at recreating or even attempting to mirror. Can you hit the next slide, please? The other thing we found in research as it relates to workforce development, because when you think about it, college is about getting to the point where you have a certain amount of skills to enter the workforce, same with high school even. So. One of the things that we found about uh, workforce development or the future of work is that whether you want to focus on entrepreneurship, 
or whether you want to focus on, you know, getting a traditional job and climbing a ladder, there is a set of skills that tend to help people move forward with either creating a successful business or climbing a ladder, what we will call upward mobility from within an organization. And so for the slide you're looking at, the list of uh, both skill sets and character virtues on the left is what about 25 years worth of research is documented from um, folks who work in organizational behavior and work studying organizational culture. They interviewed a bunch of CEOs and a bunch of entrepreneurs who have uh, created long lasting businesses. And that's what they found uh, were the leadership domains, character virtues and skill, skill sets that help them do the work. Now, the list on the right, and I think this is really important for the world that we are living in right now and inheriting in the context of pandemics and social unrest and the idea that people are going to have to really up their game in self-care and take care of themselves. And those of us who are adults are really going to have to up our game and how we are collaborating with young people for them to take care of themselves and create well-being for themselves. This list on the right is a list of uh, the character virtues and skill sets that buffer something called psychopathology. Psychopathology is the deterioration of, of one's mental health, excuse me, the deterioration of one's mental health and mental well being. So there are things in life that are out of your control, there are things in life that are in your control. Both categories of things can really do a wear and tear on your body. Stress mechanism can do a wear and tear on your mental health, can do a wear and tear on just your psychological health. And whether or not we realize it, our mental health, our psychological health, and our physical health, all of it's impacted by really stressful situations that will over time wear us down psychologically, mentally, physically. So tending to those um our needs in those areas are really, really important, particularly, again, at a time when we're all living through a lot of uncertainty. So what was fascinating for me throughout this research, can you actually go back one slide? Right. These skill sets here, go forward a slide, please. And these two lists of skill sets here have a lot of synonyms. There's a lot of bleed over categories, a lot of bleed over um, ideas around what character virtues or character traits should be refined in young people. Also, what skill sets should we be building in young people? A lot, a lot of area here that's shared between psychological well being or buffering the impacts of trauma and chronic, excuse me, and chronic stress. Also, what helps someone be a successful CEO or entrepreneur? And what skill sets are going to help you navigate a transitioning economy where automation and technology are threatening jobs and you need to figure out where you're going to get in and to fit in, right? So what's fascinating to me through all of this research is that what's good for a person psychologically and in terms of caring for their mental health is going to be good for them to either start a business or to climb up a ladder or to find a job in the context of COVID-19 and all the other things that are colliding at the same time. What does this ultimately mean? What this ultimately means is that these are all core human skills and traits, and these are some of the hardest things to measure. But what's not hard to measure, or what's not hard to do, are create the environments where young people can actually build character virtues or refine character virtues like courage. It takes a lot of courage to come to a group and assess your skill set and figure out where your gaps are and then approach another young person to encourage them to partner with you or to try to convince them to partner with you. That takes courage. It takes some willpower, right? It takes interpersonal skills. It takes some future mindedness because you understand that to accomplish X and Y or to accomplish A and B thing, I need things that aren't here with me because in projecting forward, I'm going to make some mistakes and I need to partner with people who can help me compensate for that, collaborate with me for that. And so now we're talking about insight. We're talking about honesty, right? Integrity. We're talking about building trust between people all just in one series of activities that's gonna happen in doing good. There are a number of ways, and that's just one example, there are a number of ways that doing good and instruments for success are fortifying these skill sets in young people and also making sure that we're refining these character virtues in young people and giving them the opportunity to make mistakes. Because the other space is like, you can't grow skills or refine your character without being able to make mistakes, learn and grow from them in the context of really healthy relationships with adults. And that's the last thing I wanna leave you with here is that all of these skill sets and character virtues are socially based. You have to build them with other people for them to really refine themselves and take root. 
Thank you much. I'm gonna pass it off back to Joseph. Thank you very much, Ms. O'Brien. Uh, and now Ms. Hillary Dow Ward, please. Um, you can wrap all of this up and uh, you can actually also introduce everyone to our wonderful alumni that we have on the call. So Hillary, please. Hi again, thank you so much. We have three of our alums with us today, alum, alumna and alumni with us today. And we have uh, given them a few question prompts that we wanna share. So let's see here. Will Claire and Chloe and Marquise, will you unmute and show your smiling faces? Thank you, it's so good to see you. Hello everyone. Okay, hello. So we talked a little bit before about, uh, well, you talked about your experiences a little bit with Project 440, but I would like to dive into that a little bit more because I think we can talk about it all day because us as adults that work for the organization, we think it's amazing. This is why we do the work. And so I think that there are commonly questions for you about the experiences you had as students and what it is that you are experiencing now as university students having been part of our program. So I wanna start by asking Marquise a question. So Marquise, the question for you is, how has Project 440 shaped you as a music student and how did it prepare you to be an organizational leader? And can you tell us a little bit about the organization that you started as part of your Doing Good project? Sure. Uh, I'd say with Project 440, I learned it in, throughout all of their programs, a set of transferable skills that uh, can take me through any professional world, be that classical music, or some kind of other leading of an organization or group of people. So it really helped me connect those skills that I learned as a musician, like listening to others, even though you may, uh, when you have to be in the background and learning how to collaborate with people and reach out to people who are older than you and people who are on the kind of same playing field as you and kind of teaching respect and all of those fun characteristics that people have that we love working with. So I learned how to use those skills and kind of incorporate them into every professional space I've been in. And that actually helped me with, uh, form the Center City Chamber Orchestra, which uh, myself and a bunch of my friends, uh, we got together, well, and went through Project 440's Doing Good program. And we made this orchestra because there was a need for uh, opportunities for students to conduct. We recognized that we all had opportunities to play an orchestra and chamber music. And thanks to Project 440, we even got kind of an end on the administrative side but still conducting was kind of one of the only professions no one had access to. So we provided the space for uh, students in the Philadelphia area to, uh, well, conduct on the podium, but also students played in these orchestras. And we also served as the board members for this orchestra. So we had to kind of create our own budget. And thanks to the leadership of Doing Good, Michael, Brian, and Susanna, we learned how to manage some money and really make things meet and tie things up. So it was a really great experience for myself. And then carrying into my uh, college years uh, at starting at Cleveland, I knew that I wanted, to, I wanted to do more than just play the clarinet. I recognized that my degree after four years of uh, studying at CIM would say one thing. It would say that I'm a bachelor of music and it has the clarinet and all of those things in my name, but that doesn't really add up to anything tangible other than the degree itself. I wanted more to show and I wanted to gain experiences that will allow me to do that uh, in the future. So that's kind of why I tagged on the organizational leadership minor with Case Western's School of Management. And it's uh, hopefully going to mend very well with the music, uh, very intense music curriculum I'm getting at CIM. And I, the more I kind of study and go into these fields, I, one just really enforces the other. When you learn how to uh, civilly settle disagreements in regards to budgeting and just any other disagreement you may ever have, uh, you really learn how to listen to other people's interpretations when they're from Cleveland and they don't play the way they do in Philly. But guess what? We learn how to work together through all of these areas in our lives and we take those skills everywhere we go. And that's kind of why I'm extremely grateful for Project 440. Oh, that's wonderful. So would you recommend Project 440 programming to a student in Philadelphia or across the nation? Yes, any yeah. and every student. Any and every student. Perfect. 
quotation. Very good. Thank you for sharing that. So I want to move on to Claire and Chloe now to ask you girls some questions. And I recognize that your organization, you work together to build yours. So there may be some points when the two of you want to share information in tandem with one another about your program and the project that you put together with us. But first, I want to ask you two individual questions before you tell us a little bit about Generation Music. So Claire, I wanted to ask you, what has Project 440 given you that you don't think you would have gotten from any other place, from school, from any other program? Um, Project 440 has given me opportunity. I have, and basically just like knowledge. I have gone to a performing arts school since sixth grade. And um, I'm not gonna say like they didn't teach me something because they definitely did. But Project 440 has taught me that I can use my talent and my ability to do something else and something great and to help others. So you like um, being able to learn how to do that and actually put forth my ideas was really cool. And it was just something that I wasn't introduced to until I joined this group. Um, can you say the question one more time, <laughs> please? So in, in general, it's just what did you experience through Project 440 that you didn't experience during your, your school day or with another organization in general? So you're doing a fabulous job of answering that. Yes. <laughs> um, with Opportunity, Project 440 gave me a chance to use my own voice, not just through music and how to, again, use my talent, not just to entertain, but to help. Um, I would say that the opportunity that was given was, uh, again, to use my own voice and put forth something that I, I wanted to see a, a change in my own community and just not just in my community that I live in, but in my music community. And I wanted to see different faces and different personalities and stuff in my music community. So the opportunity that was given to me was like, Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay. And before we start talking about your project, I want to ask Chloe a question for her to answer as well. So Chloe, you um, also have gone quite a ways away from home for, for university and to continue studying music. And I'm curious how um, any of our, our course preparations or any of the materials you experienced uh, in our Project 440 programming, how did that contribute towards your ability to select a school a long way from home or be a successful student a long way from home? Just to start there as a, as a point of question. Um, for me, I would say that um, going through the Instruments for Success course when I was a junior um, really helped me out a lot because being able to sit in Sigis's class and just hear him just giving all this knowledge that like you can't find like easily through like a Google search um, to say. Uh, I always knew that I wanted to go out of state for college. Um, I just didn't really know how far I wanted to like move away from home. So with keeping that in mind, like working with Sigis, he really helped me like narrow down um, areas that I could look into for schools and schools that also had, of course, the major I um, was interested in. And I was able to choose my school, the University of Tampa, uh, mostly because the music program is amazing there. Um, I'm very like happy with it and satisfied. I had an amazing first year. Um, and I also, I mean, it's a plus, I go to school in Florida um, and it's perfect year round. <laughs> but overall, I think that, uh, sorry, Instruments for Success really has helped me. And just keeping in mind, like, I learned so much from Instruments for Success and my biggest takeaway from the program was learning about like the financial aid process because there was just so much that I didn't know because of course this is my first time going to college and for my mom this was the first time she had one of her kids go to college since she had gone and so much had changed since she went to college so it was almost it was a new experience for both of us and we didn't really know what to expect how to expect it and so just having Sigis uh, just be by our side and helping us constantly was really helpful. I honestly don't think that if I didn't have Sigis to help me with like FAFSA and like learning about appeal processes, I think I'd be going to a different school just because of how expensive it is. Um, so I'm extremely grateful for that. 
Yes, that, it's, it's truly remarkable. And this summer during our Project 440 online course, for which all of you are peers serving as peer mentors with us this summer. Thank you, of course, for that. Uh, it's been amazing to hear the questions from the students all across the country about those exact exact same topics. And so it's been amazing to um, have Sigis. He's, he's such a treasure for our program and so many students, absolutely. Now, the last thing I wanna ask the two of you about is about your organization that you formed as Doing Good Students in Project 440. So can you tell us a little bit about the idea, how you came to that idea, where you saw the need, the age of the students that you serve, so on and so forth. Because I think we've recently had a question about um, younger students, working with younger students. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that as well. Okay, I'll start, Chloe. Then you do what we're doing now. <laughs> um, so we started uh, our junior year of high school and we joined Project 440. And one of the, I remember Susanna saying like something, the assignment was something that you want to change in your neighborhood. And the first thing I thought was, hmm, well, there aren't that many diverse orchestras. So let's think of a way that we can fix that problem. And Chloe kind of had the same idea. And we thought, well, when did we start playing instruments? And we're both like, oh, like when we were in like middle school, elementary. So we're like, okay, let's start there. And we decided to create a nonprofit called Generation Music. And we visit middle schools and elementary schools and it's like a peer-to-peer -peer teaching workshop experience with them we create lesson plans completely from scratch really hard <laughs> and we make powerpoints and we even do a therapeutic activity where we have the students listen to different pieces and have different colors mean different feelings and they color down the color that the the piece may make them feel so like jaws is like scary so it's red or something like that um, we've also, um, we also have made, or sorry, not made, we also have a partnership with Settlement Music School. It's a music school in Philadelphia, and it's a school where they give lessons for different instruments and have different ensembles for young students. And we've made a partnership with them to create a larger workshop called Night of the Orchestra. And this was actually an idea that kind of branched off an idea Marquise gave me, which thank you for that, because it's going great. Um, where it's kind of like an instrument petting zoo, but the students don't actually touch the instruments because all of the musicians that we use for them are volunteer high school musicians that we just know from going to a performing arts high school. And that's really cool because the way we pay them is with pizza, kind of like how Project 440 used to pay us <laughs> with pizza and it works. <laughs> um, and this is a interactive workshop where the students are able to walk around the room and we have it set up with um, all the instruments from the orchestra. We try to get all of them like French horn, oboe, bassoon, the little ones that get hidden that no one really knows about. And so the students are able to get a live experience of what the instrument sounds like because um, we did a little bit of research and we found that listening to an instrument live is different than listening to a video. So we kind of wanted to figure out how to incorporate both that and the experience and we figured it out. But here's Chloe with the rest. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm trying to pick up where you left off. What we're working on now, <laughs> what we're working on now, we actually uh, recently in February, we both went to um, the Sphinx Connect. Um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the word. Um, we went to Sphinx Connect in February. Yes, and you and guys exhibited at Sphinx Connect. And yes, yes you were exhibitors, and yes. We were mm -hmm. able to have a table set up with other similar organizations and we were able to really broadcast our uh, message some more people and bring more awareness to what we'll do what we do um after that um COVID happened so we had to kind of stop uh going to schools and conducting workshops but uh this summer we've been talking with our team and we have started uh this idea of creating a YouTube channel where we can post like mini master classes that are about less than 10 minutes long for anyone to watch and we were going to kind of just start making like first there'll be like introductory videos and then as we progress along there'll be videos about like for example if it's a clarinet it will be you know how to put on your read for a clarinet things like that and we're really excited about that we have found volunteers for all of the orchestral instruments so we are going to start you know reaching out to them and have them creating videos for us 
and we are hoping to kind of have them posted by August. And after, what, have, what else have we done after that? Oh, and I we, huh? we forgot to mention we joined Project 448 for a second year, our senior year. And that way, and through that, Susanna was kind of touching on that. We were able to, um, what is the word, recruit some board members. So now we have like a working board and we have like a, um, we have like board meetings and everything like that, but keep going, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we, I just forgot as well, thank you. Um, yeah, we started, we did uh, doing good for the second time. And the second time was actually beneficial because Claire and I, we of course were able to recruit more people to kind of help us out with the workload and kind of divide up different tasks. But we were also able to just kind of learn more about like what you have to do behind the scenes with an organization so we kind of learned more about budgeting and managing money um more we also learned more like um tactics about fundraising and creating like grant writing things like that um i actually if it's okay i saw a question in the chat and i think it's for claire and i and the question says have have you all ever felt as oh sorry have you all ever felt as if this was too hard and thought about giving up yeah. And I wanted to touch on that because I remember last summer, Claire and I were talking about um, how, you know, we're going to college, but for her, she was going to Temple, so she was staying in the city. But for me, I was moving like a thousand miles away, so I wouldn't be as involved as I was for the past two years. And it was, you know, it was a lot to take in and to kind of be okay with. And at the same time, you know, you kind of prep for, you know, that part when I'm not going to be in Philadelphia. So this is as much as I can do from where I am You prep for it. But then when I actually got to Florida, it kind of felt different, like it hit different for me because it's like, I'm actually here. So throughout my first year of college, um, Claire and our team have done multiple like in-person events where I haven't been to because I was in I was at school and of course like you know I felt I didn't like feel guilty because like I knew it wasn't my fault but it also just sucked because you know I wasn't there as you know this is something that Claire and I created and to see it grow so much and then not to be there anymore just kind of like you know hurt so you know in a sense like I know I don't want to say like I felt like giving up because this is just something that I love too much to just drop. And I feel like we've grown so much where throwing it away almost seems wasteful in a sense. Um, but I have, you know, thought about, you know, would it like, would I have to step down more than I already have? And that's something I really don't want to do. Uh, so yeah, like, I'm going <laughs> to end that one there. Well, my goodness, I thank all three of you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us today because there's no better advocates for our program than our students and our alumni. So thank you so much for all that you say. We did not have to poke or prod them at all or pay them with pizza to join us today and say these nice things, thankfully. And we're so proud of the work that they're doing in their community, in their neighborhoods, and of course, um, out in the world. So couldn't be prouder for them to carry the Project 440 name with them. I'm gonna turn it back over to Joseph Conyers so we can give thanks for our uh, time today with um, Yola and with the LA Phil. And thank you all for joining us. Back to Joseph. Thank you very much, Hillary. Thank you to our alumni. Thank you to everyone on the panel, Michael and uh, Susanna. Um, we are really excited about the work that we're doing in Philadelphia. We got a lot of questions. I was actually really busy. You probably saw me answering questions and we're out of time, so we can't answer any questions at this moment, but we'll try to get them all and try to get answers back to you for sure. Um, we are so thankful to Yola for giving us this opportunity, this platform to talk about Project 40. We're also excited and very thankful to Yola to, with partnering for us with us this summer as part of our Project 40 online programming. So we have, a, it's about 50-50 students from 440 and from Yola. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful um, relationship and partnership. And we just hope to see it grow and provide more opportunities for young people. It was one way we took on this pandemic and just tried to, to, to we took, we made lemons y'all out of, uh, no lemonade out of lemons. That's what we did. <laughs> and um, uh, so we're really grateful for that. So um, thank you, Angelica, you have popped back up. I don't know if there's anything else we should do. We're wrapping up. But um, thank you so much. And we'll try to get those answers to y'all uh, for any questions you might have about the organization, including how you might get 
Project 440 online in your community. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much to the entire Project 440 team for being here with us. Um, and Joe, uh, Yola, and Yola National have learned a ton from working with you all. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I think the only last thing that I'll ask is that if you don't mind dropping either um, your website or your Instagram handles or whatever, the best way to uh, put that is into the chat, that'd be great. And beyond that. And we can even put it on the screen. We can share the screen with our, our info on the last page. We didn't get to that part of the of the um, PowerPoint. PowerPoint. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. OK, well, there we go. That, um, that's all that we've got, I think. So thank you again to everyone on the Project 440 team. And uh, we'll catch the rest of you all in further sessions next week. Thanks, team. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Bye. <laughs> everyone.